The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. We're going to give our colleagues here just another moment or two to join the session here before we go ahead and get started. All right, thank you everyone for joining the session today. My name is Lucas Drega. I'll be taking us through the webinar today. So before we go ahead and get started here on this topic of AI cutting through the hype, I wanna go through a couple of quick housekeeping items as well as touch on how you can interact with us throughout the course of the session today. So as you're probably seeing here on screen, this is a go-to webinar session and as such, you will all be muted. That being said, we do wanna encourage interaction and there's a couple of different ways that you can do so. All right, first and foremost, on the right-hand side of your screen there, you'll see the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, within there, there is a questions pane. So if you have a question that comes up as we're going through the content here, perhaps there's something that you'd like us to expand upon. You know, please do type in your questions here. Uh, if we don't answer them as we go along, we've set aside a few moments towards the end of the session today to address those questions as a group. Now that the, the housekeeping here is out of the way, you know, I wanted to touch on the agenda briefly here before we go ahead and get started. And I think this is a topic that a lot of us have seen quite a bit about as of late. You know, I was in the Microsoft Ignite conference in Orlando a few weeks back, and this topic of AI in business was something that you couldn't get away from, right? It was pervasive through sessions of, of all types, whether it was an end user session, more developer focused or executive. You know, there was this theme throughout the conference, and really what we're looking to do here today is demystify a lot of that, right? Give you some practical guidance as to the different types of artificial intelligence, you know, which ones are more useful in businesses today and which ones are better kept in science fiction for now. We'll kind of dive deeper uh, into the different types of AI, you know, what are the different applications within an enterprise, right? What are some of the use cases that we've seen here so far? And then give you an example of what we refer to as an intelligent business application. Right. Now, I know a lot of you are probably familiar with Agile Point's form and workflow driven applications capabilities here, but you'll show you how we can take this a couple of steps forward and implementing some of the more pragmatic or practical AI in a business application. Right. As we mentioned here, we do want to encourage interaction. So if you have a question, please do type it into the, uh, the questions panel there and we'll address these as a group towards the end of the session. Okay, so I'm going to bring up my first poll question here. You know, really what we're looking to do is, is get a sense of, you know, who's on, the, who's on the call today, you know, what your areas of interest might be. So we'll give you a, a few moments here to input your answers, and uh, we'll go ahead and discuss them as a group. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close my poll question here and uh, bring up the results. All right, excellent. Okay, so continuing on here, you know, I wanted to start off with our first major topic, and that is sort of demystifying some of these different types of AI, right? What can be used in a practical basis in today's enterprise, really of all sizes, and what is best left towards film and, uh, and novels for now? So to kind of start this conversation here, I have a quote from Mike Galtieri, one of the principal analysts over at Forrester, 
who spent a lot of his time recently to uh, investigate this area of AI. And again, what's reality and what's fiction? All right, so this first topic that I wanted to address here is this concept of pure AI, right? What does this mean um, and what are the implications to us? Well, if we take this quote here as a guide, it really kind of sums up the ability to fully mimic human intelligence essentially in any way, right? So this can be the ability to sense, to learn, to think, and take actions independently of any human handlers. Right now, obviously, this is something that we've seen in pop culture from time to time, but I think for a lot of us, this can be quite unsettling, right? So let's take, talk through some of the different considerations here as we're looking further into these types of use cases. Now, obviously, so far, you know, the, the concept of pure AI has really kind of stemmed from a very science fiction type of background, right? Um, there's a number of examples over the years here, and I've put forth a few examples more recently that really well illustrate this concept, right? So again, this concept of pure AI is the ability to fully mimic in every sense human capabilities, right? So for those of you who perhaps have an HBO subscription, maybe you've seen the Westworld uh, television series that ended its first season last year, right? The story essentially was, um, this is a theme park that is completely Old West themed, right? So as a, an attendee of this theme park, I can go spend uh, a day, a week, a month, and fully immerse myself into this Old West experience. I mean, I can ride horses, I can shoot rifles, I can drink whiskey, and interact with all of the citizens in this fictional town, right? Obviously, these are all robots who are fully autonomous within the context of their design, right? Able to interact with, uh, with attendees, right? To provide them that fully immersive experience. Now, for those of you who have seen the series, you probably realize that at some point along the, uh, the first season there, things started to go awry. Right. Perhaps some of these machines were starting to recall um, some of their mistreatment in the past. Right. One of the themes of the film was, was to kind of explore what it means to be a robot, what it explore, what it means to be uh, a human being. Right. And when those two worlds converge, you know, what are the implications there? Right. So at some point, a, a lot of these robots essentially became aware of their station in life, that they were essentially subservient uh, to these human handlers. Right. Obviously, not to give away too many spoilers here. But in short, things start to go pretty badly, right? Very similar with Cyberdyne systems, right? Their example here uh, from the Terminator series was around Skynet, right? Now, this was a, a technology that was implemented to automate a lot of the modern aspects of war, right? Things like troop movements, artillery, what have you, right? And was intended to be autonomous, right? To be able to make decisions as to how best to, to, uh, to engage in this conflict, right? For the most optimal results. Now, obviously, that sounds great and obviously a little bit scary. But again, you know, one of the things that we've seen here in these types of uh, situations is that there's this problem where at some point, right, Skynet became uh, sentient, was able to think and act upon its own accord and very quickly realized, you know, based on, you know, the, the propensity for humans to enter into conflict, right, that the human race would ultimately be a, a huge um, concern, right, for the overall stability of the Earth as a whole. Right. As such, the natural corrective action uh, in the eyes of Skynet was to eliminate the human race and eliminate the conflict. Right. So obviously, so far, you know, very science fiction heavy backgrounds. But we're starting to see some of these challenges when a machine becomes autonomous, is able to think for itself. Right. And I think that really dovetails very nicely into some of the considerations that we're seeing in this space. Right. A lot of the examples that we've shown so far have dealt with this problem of alignment. Right. How do we design a system that is in lockstep with our goals uh, as humans? Right. And a lot of this kind of goes back to some of the early writings of science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. Right. He uh, initially defined three rules that should govern the human and robot interaction. Right. First of which is a robot must not harm a human being. Right. For any of those who have seen some of the previous examples that we spoke to just a moment ago, you'll know that that in and of itself is a pretty significant challenge, right? The second rule is that it must obey orders, provided it does not violate rule number one, right? Sounds pretty straightforward. But again, if we're to believe any of these films or any of these TV shows that have come out as of late, this in and of itself is also fairly difficult. And lastly, a robot must seek to protect its own existence, provided it doesn't violate rules one and two. All right, so a few simple rules 
but in practicality here, at least what we've seen so far, pretty difficult to adhere to. Right, but that's not really the only concern here, right? There's obviously competing um, competing uh, interests, right? Um, so that brings up a very interesting ethical question. You know, if we have competing interests, how do we design for a system that is the most egalitarian for the largest group of people? Now, while a lot of us think that sort of our day-to-day -day human interactions can be fairly straightforward or fairly effortless, right? For those of you who have maybe seen two chatbots chatting back and forth, you know that this capability isn't fully there yet either, right? That this is an extremely complex task that we're that we're that we've looking to take up. And as such, it's still about a hundred years out. Now, obviously, that's great news for a lot of us here on screen. Again, if we're to believe some of these uh, examples from film, right, that's obviously not going to be too great for us. But if you ask folks like Elon Musk, right, this is the most pressing technological concern of our time. So some things to think about there. Luckily, it's still a few years away from really coming down the pike for us. So before we transition here, I want to bring us up to our next poll question here. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that poll up. Give you guys a few seconds to answer. And then let's close those poll results. All right, let's go ahead and close those poll results. All right, excellent. Okay, so shifting gears now from sort of the science fiction realm to that of a much more practical and pragmatic application for artificial intelligence. Right now, the, uh, the conferences that we've been to as of late, again, this has been a pretty big topic and a lot of it has dealt with, you know, how we can use this more pragmatic flavor of AI and what are the sort of business expectations that we can see as a result of implementation? All right, so a couple of things to think about just in general here, you know, as we discuss pragmatic AI, it's not necessarily one type of, app of technology, right, but generally multiple, right? So it's not really a matter of implementing machine learning or implementing natural language processing, right? It's generally a combination of these sorts of things. Whereas our pure AI scenario was more general in purpose, right? It was to imitate uh, human capabilities, as we mentioned, essentially in every sense, right? The real world types of AI become much narrower in scope, right? Generally speaking, while there are different types with different goals in mind or different objectives, they generally have a couple of um, shared purposes, right? First of which is to be able to predict outcomes. Right, very helpful, obviously, from a business scenario where if I were to do this with my business, I can expect that as a result. Right, or perhaps in the e-commerce world, being able to provide a much more personalized experience to my consumer. Right now, again, it's not necessarily about implementing these technologies and these technologies alone, but how we can integrate these into existing business applications, into existing business processes. Right, and the long story short here is that a lot of these technologies are much easier to consume than ever and can provide tremendous business value today. So kind of moving in from the high level here, um, we're gonna focus our, our lens a little bit around natural language processing and give some implications as to what that means in today's businesses, right? So if you contrast this with, uh, with previously, up until this point, if we wanted to interact with a machine of some sort or a computer or a system, we generally had to do it on the computer's terms, right? Now that obviously has a, a higher barrier to entry for, for a lot of folks you know, in, the, in the world, right? We obviously have different types of programming languages for specific purposes here, but the goal of natural language processing is sort of to democratize access to these machines, right? We can use our, our normal course of speech, our normal manner of speaking, and are able to interact with the machine of some sort. Now, what is the value of this solution, right, or this technology here? Well, it really looks to do a couple of things, right? One, make it much easier for uh, a broader audience to, to interact with different types of machines, right? Again, we're not needing to write code or write SQL statements to, to derive value or to analyze a data set. Right now, we can simply talk to some sort of system, right? So analyzing perhaps the uh, transcript of a speech, right? Analyzing a uh, body of an email. Right. This is technology that we're already seeing in a lot of applications outside of e-commerce, right, within the enterprise as well. And I think it's pretty safe to say that at this point, the consumer use cases are fairly well mature at this point. 
right? It started off with something like Siri, and then a few ladder entries into the market came not, not long after. But they're to the point now where these sorts of APIs can be exposed, right, to a broader development community and to be able to leverage these capabilities in all of my native mobile applications. But that's not really the focus for today. You know, given that we all are, are in the enterprise space, you know, wanted to really focus on where NLP fits in the enterprise space today. Now, this can take a whole number of different forms and different use cases, but one of the ones that we've seen a lot as of late over the last year or so has to do with chatbots. Right. Again, this was a major theme from the recent Ignite conference, upcoming Dreamforce conference. I'm sure we'll have a, a similar place at center stage here. Right. And we've seen this across all sorts of organizations of all sizes today. Right. When a customer comes to us to talk to Algebra Point about you know, how we might be able to use AI, uh, there's generally been a couple of different scenarios that we found this fits best. And it can be summed up into two main categories. Right. One of facilitating customer service. Right. As if you can imagine sort of your, your standard e-commerce retailer or something similar, right? There's a tremendous number of very menial or tedious tasks. Right. So as an example here, we have on screen, you know, anything related to order management. Right. If I place an order with Amazon as an example, right, and I want to modify that order, that's not necessarily the task um, that needs to be performed by a human agent. Right. Instead, we can chat back and forth with the bot, and in so doing, it will guide me towards the correct. Uh, the correct selection or the correct action that I'd like to take. Now, we've certainly seen this quite a bit outside of the e-commerce space and also in enterprises of all sizes, right? And it generally comes down to, again, facilitating this self-service or providing higher levels of customer service. Right? So on the enterprise space, things like help desk, right? A lot of the customers that we speak with, they have you know, these great applications to manage you know, any aspect of, of IT service management. Right. But oftentimes these end users don't necessarily know where they need to go for help. Right. So being able to chat back and forth with the bot is obviously not only providing a much more engaging experience, but much more in context help. Right. Guiding the user towards the correct resource to address the challenge that they might have. Right. Also, with respect to access to different sorts of resources, right, whether it's a, a project based resource, uh, resources related to a specific role or job function. You know, we've seen a lot of our customers implement this sort of technology to facilitate that process as well, right? These customers may not know where the data that they're after is physically located, whether it's in system A or system B, right? So providing a chatbot interface is not only much more inviting, but again, you know, guides them towards uh, the resource that they need. And for those of you on the phone who have maybe come to us from a SharePoint perspective, seen a lot of this in governance applications as of late. Right. Uh, again, a, a user wants to maybe spin up a, a SharePoint site, as an example, right? And the bot might ask a series of questions. What is the what is the name of the site? You know, what is the nature of the content that you'll be storing there? And who do you need to collaborate with? Right. All of these questions can have sim simple answers and can do a couple of things. Right. Can ensure that the right governance policy is applied to the site. Uh, you know, perhaps in the case of more heavily regulated industries, you know, we can ensure that the right information management policies or, or retention schedules have been applied, All right? So many different use cases within the enterprise, a lot of which are coming down to these key areas of self-service and facilitating a much more engaging customer experience. Okay, so if natural language processing is sort of the starter pack for artificial intelligence, machine learning is gonna take this a couple of steps further. Right. And really, the, the main goal of machine learning is sort of the holy grail for a lot of enterprises that we've spoken with. Right. This ability to have sort of a crystal ball like ability to pre predict the future. Right. Again, if if this event were to take place in my business or if I were to take this potential strategy, what are the implications to my business? Right now, obviously, given that the value uh, or the potential value rather is extremely high, there has to be a number of considerations to go along with that. Right not the least of which is the nature of your data, right? Is it clean? Is it structured in a unified way, right? To address some of these concerns here, you really need to think a lot of, along the same lines as when you've implemented big data analytics, right? Not only do I have data structured in a way that can be consumed universally, but also do I have the data volume, right? And sometimes this could be multiple years of data or many millions of data points. And then lastly, for those maybe who took statistics in high school or college, 
right? There's the question of what is this data telling me, right? I can beat this data up all day long and at some point it's gonna tell me what I want it to, right? So this kind of begs the question of, you know, is this cor correlation or is it causation, right? Now that being said, there is tremendous enterprise value here and I wanna speak to a couple of examples that I've heard as of late. You know, not long ago, I was speaking with a, uh, a customer who processed huge amounts of invoices in a given week or a given month, right? And in so doing, what they were able to do was capture, um, you know, this data for a period of a couple of years, such that they had, you know, a reliable data set to extract insights from, right? This customer was leveraging OCR to process their invoices, right? Using the OCR technology to capture the values from the invoice right, and make sure that it gets routed for the appropriate levels of approval. Well, what happens if the OCR malfunctions, right? What if instead of a $10,000 invoice, OCR read this as a million dollar invoice? Well, this is where machine learning can kick in, right? Based on my historical data, based on, you know, uh, suppliers of a given type who supply my organization with product X, Y, and Z, right? I know with a certain percentage likelihood that this is a $10,000 invoice as opposed to a $1 million invoice. Right, so one pretty simple example uh, in the enterprise space around catching anomalies, right? Very similarly in fraud detection, right? Similar rules can apply. And I know that a lot of you are very familiar with Amazon, right? Amazon's recommendation engine is again, built on huge volumes of customer data, right? So they can say with a certain degree of, of likelihood that if a customer purchases product A, based on historical data, products B and C may also be relevant. Right. So again, machine learning is really coming down to the ability to one, predict outcomes and also to provide this concept of hyper personalization. Right. Customers like you also were interested in X as an example. Now, while a lot of this has tremendous enterprise value, um, you know, and that there are a number of things to think about, you know, one of the most exciting things about this area as of late is that this technology is much more accessible than it ever was before. Right. Bottom of the screen here, what you're seeing are a series of logos, right? Each correlates to a particular vendor's offering in the machine learning, cognitive services areas, what have you. And really what this means is, you know, I don't need to be a data scientist. I don't need to be versed in R or Python to be able to take advantage of these scenarios, right? Really all that I need is as a business user or a developer or whomever is to think about, you know, are there areas in my business that can benefit from some of these things that we mentioned earlier, right? Predicting outcomes, providing a much more personalized experience for my customer, whether that's an internal customer or external, right? And because it's an API, we can make it very easy to integrate into existing business processes. Right now we'll close the, uh, the session today with an example here in just a moment, but wanted to give you a sense of the, uh, the remaining components of the, uh, of the session today. So I'm gonna bring up my last poll question here, give you guys a few seconds to answer the question before we uh, transition away into the, uh, the brief demo. So we'll just give you another second or two here to input your answers, and then I'm gonna close the poll here in a moment. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll. Okay, so this brings us to the demo scenario that I wanted to talk through today. Um, you know, really kind of going back to some of these examples that we talked about earlier on in the natural, pro natural language processing realm, you know, of providing a much more engaging experience, right, and one that provides uh, a whole lot more uh, in terms of in-context help. So just give me one quick second here. I'm going to switch away from my PowerPoint deck over to um, my demo. So the, uh, the context of my example here today is a public facing onboarding application for a law firm, right? This is something that we see a lot of our legal clients struggling with, right? How do we um, ingest and onboard new clients? Now you'll see here that I've brought up uh, the consumer version of Skype here. And within that I have my Vaxo law bot. But, you know, as I mentioned, this can be surfaced in a number of different ways, right? In addition to Skype, also things like Skype for Business, Microsoft Teams, but also, you know, just a, a chat window that might be on your intranet site or your dot com site, as an example. 
So instead of filling in a form where there's potential confusion as to the nature of the data that's being requested, you know, general unfamiliarity with it, right? I can chat back and forth with this bot, and in so doing, it will handle the process of scheduling my consultation, right? It'll handle billing me accordingly, right? Based on the the lawyer that I select, as well as the consultation length, and go ahead and automate the uh, the, the sending out of, of this bill to the end customer. So there's a couple of ways that I can interact with this bot here. I can click. As an example, I can also talk or type. So it's going to ask me here, what is the consultation length, right? There's going to be perhaps a different approval process or at the very least, uh, a different cost associated with different consultation lengths. So I'm going to go ahead and select a 40-minute uh, consultation. I've worked with my colleague John Smith in the past here. And now it's starting to ask me for information about myself. Right. If at any point in time here I'm uncertain as to you know what's being asked, um, you know things like that, I can always ask for help. Right. It's going to tell me the nature of the data that's being requested here, as well as things like status. Right. A number of our customers come to Agile Point for insight into their business processes. Right. So as you can see here, when I type in the word status, right, I can see the questions that have been answered thus far and those that are remaining. So I'm going to finish this off here. Enter my date, my name, my last name. My email address, this is going to be important here because based on the email address, this is where we're going to point the invoice to, right? So this is something that's going external to the organization, right? As far as uh, we're concerned in this use case here, Agile Point or this bot does not know who I am. I'm not authenticated in any systems, right? And just based on the email address here, it's going to bring in an external participant. Type in a phone number and a backup. Best time to reach me is generally 9 a.m. And now it wants to know a little bit about my case. I'm a Canadian citizen, so I need help oops, with immigration. Okay, it's asking me to confirm my selection so far. I'm going to type OK. It prompts me to agree, to agree to terms and conditions. I can read those here, but I can just agree now for demonstration purposes. And now what it's going to do is it's actually going to pass all of this data that's been sent over to Skype through to Agile Point NX, and it's going to route my, uh, my, my selection, my consultation for approval and for invoicing. So what I can do here is I can just click copy this link, type in the uh, URL here, and this is going to bring me now to an Agile Point form. All right, so all of the data that I captured via Skype has now been passed through to Agile Point. Right, you'll see all of my selections here based on the consultation length. I'm going to be billed for $99. And I can go ahead and input my payment details to go ahead and execute the remainder of this workflow. So that's the demo that I had for today here. Um, you just want to quickly switch back over to my PowerPoint deck here. And to take some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to the, uh, the questions panel here and see what we've got. All right. So the first question is, um, what is the custom? What are the? How are customers using chatbots today? Well, so far, I mean, the best example that we've seen so far is around the example that we just showed, right? So providing sort of self-service or customer service-focused use cases. Um, but in addition to that, you know, what we've also seen is, um, you know, being able to surface much more relevant information, right? A lot of us are inundated on a daily basis with the ability with um, a whole lot of data, right? And oftentimes it can be paralyzing, right? So a lot of our customers have started to use bots to surface up the most relevant content based on the tasks they need to provide, right? Um, so, you know, if I'm looking at a, a customer record, right, I can talk to a bot and say, show me all of the support cases as an example. You know, show me the number of which that are high priority as an example. Okay, hope that answers your question. We can always, uh, we can always follow up for more detail there if you so desire. Next question that's coming in here, what is the level of effort to build the chatbot that we saw today? So a lot of what Agile Point is doing is you know, going to be uh, in the areas of lower no-code development. Uh, the bots are going to be a slight departure from that. It is very code heavy. Um, so the bot that we showed just a moment ago, I think probably took about four or five hours of coding effort over the period of a couple of days. Right, so still, um, you know, something that that does take some learning. There is a bit of a learning curve there, 
But you know, one of the great things about that is Agile Point has provided a, a number of different bot templates, if you will. Right. So if you'd like some help in implementing this sort of capability, you know, definitely come and talk to us. Um, you know, and there's a great chance that we can cut down on the amount of effort that it would take to implement something like that. All right. Um, so just going to wait here for a, another question or two to, to come in here. While I'm waiting for that here, I thought it would be worthwhile to point out some of the newer developments at Agile Point here, namely um, our, our new customer focused resources. Right, so as you're seeing here on screen, uh, a couple of entirely new resources in terms of our user forum. Right, this has been uh, updated and is now running on Zendesk. Right, and a great place to um, either get new information, share information that you've that you've captured over the years with our other customers. Right, as well as ask the experts, as well as our upcoming North American users group. Right, so something that we've seen um, asked for quite a bit amongst our customer base. You know, having a live weekly session where you, uh, users and customers can drop in, you know, as they have the time, right, and have a session with one of our experts, right? So this is going to be completely driven by uh, by you guys, whomever comes in and whatever sorts of questions you have, you'll help us drive the agenda on a week to week basis. All right, so um, thank you for your questions. I hope you enjoyed the session for today. That's all we have for now. Uh, so definitely, if you'd like to uh, to talk a little further about this, you know, please do let us know. My contact information here is on screen, and I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. Thanks for joining the session.